Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. Movie Talk is a show where three of us have a normal conversation, and then one giant flushes it all down the toilet. I am so excited <laughs> because we have a bevy of news stories to get to, and to introduce us to the rest of our panel, we'll go back to Natasha. <laughs> and that giant, I'm assuming, is John Schnapp sitting next to you. I don't know what Mark Ass is talking about. I was just trying to have a normal conversation. And then he just, you understand my, uh, my, what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and also joining us, Jason Inman. I am excited to be here. I'm also excited to rep Wonder Woman since this is her 75th birthday year. Oh, yeah. 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 So so thank all the Wonder Woman out there. Wonder Woman. It's very the nice Wonder of Woman you in your mm -hmm. life. To be I know who the Wonder Woman he's going against tomorrow in the oh, movie trivia showdown. That segue. would be Gray Drake. And just to get a quick temperature of the room for tomorrow's matchup, how is Mr. Inman feeling? Because Gray Drake is no stranger <laughs> to kicking some ass in movie trivia. I, I watched some of her previous matches. She can be a little crazy, but I'm bringing a secret weapon with me that I think is going to boost my confidence and push it over the edge. Nice. As long as it passes our pyrotechnic test, yeah, that's right. That's totally fine <laughs> with me. Well, speaking of all things that are excitement, nothing is cooler this summer than being live in San Diego at Comic Con this July. And here at Collider, we are thrilled to be having an awesome contest where two people can win a trip to Comic Con. Yay! You're going to win something. You can take one of your friends. We're going to pay for the airfare. We're going to pay for the badges. We're going to pay for the hotel. We will even even pay for the money we're giving you. We're going to give you 250 what? bucks in spending money that you can use on whatever you want. Buy yourself some beer, buy snaps, some free therapy yes. sessions. It doesn't <laughs> matter because you can win. All you have to do is check out the link in the description of this very vid, or you can go to quieter.com for all of the details. Schnapp, I want to throw it to you first because we do have yeah. some breaking news today. And uh, that would be the new Tupac trailer, All Eyes on Me, despite what Mr. TV Talk himself, Josh Bakuga, claims. Today was the first day that this new teaser trailer dropped. It's only a minute long. I believe it is Tupac's birthday today, yeah. yep. or would have been. So Schnapp, I'll throw it to you first. You saw this trailer with the rest of us this morning. What did you think of the teaser for All Eyes on Me? It's a great teaser. I mean, especially coming right off of uh, Straight out of Compton, this had a little bit of that flavor where, uh, you know, when I love Straight Out of Compton, I thought it was a great story, a great telling of that story, and I want to see more. And I think, you know, they, they, they previewed it a little bit in that, where Tupac was in that. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing this version and uh, to get a little deeper into what, you know, how he came up and, you know, just his, his, his uh, skill set is like, uh, you know, I don't think it's ever been beat, where he could just no. sit in a studio and create song after song after song. So, no, well, one of the more unbelievable artists that I've, you know, had the pleasure of witnessing in my lifetime. Jason, I don't know if you got a chance to see Straight Outta Compton. I did see it. But when, when I, I was watching it. that movie, mm -hmm. one of the things that stood out to me, and it was only for a second, was whoever they got to play Tupac in that movie, I'm like, that looked exactly like Tupac. Mm -hmm. And I thought that until I saw this guy playing Tupac. Yeah, yeah, we watched this teaser all before the show, and we all three of us were like, what well, the, yeah. that looks like Tupac? <laughs> that's not a hologram. That's right. a guy. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, I haven't I haven't been excited about a casting like this since I remember when Will Smith was announced as Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. and they showed the first tra trailer from Ali, and you were like, "Holy cow! He looks exactly like Ali. He sounds like Ali." This guy looks like Tupac, and I think that's going to really help sell this movie. Yeah, and, and that's really all we got from the teaser. We got a little bit of the story that they're really going to go in-depth into not only Tupac's life and his biography, but also the struggles and the pressures that he faced as he rose to fame in a skyrocketing fashion. Natasha, I want to get your take as well. You watched this teaser with all of us today. As a matter of fact, we all borrowed her computer to yes. watch it. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for queuing it up, first oh, of all. of course. <laughs> uh, second of all, what was your read on the All Eyes on Me teaser? I mean, it got me excited. I'm not too knowledgeable about all of Tupac, Tupac's work, so um, I can't really get into like how a real fan would have perceived it, but um, I especially loved how much he looked like him, and I loved when they like kind of mixed in one of his like hits in there. Like My head started bobbing. I was like, okay, <laughs> I can get with this. Like I'm definitely excited to see this movie, because he's like one of the most, or he is the most influential man in hip-hop, so it's great to kind of finally see that story come to the big screen. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and and the thing that any uh, great buyer pick hopes to do is to be able to appease to the huge fans of the source material mm -hmm. and also get a new interest in what the subject matter is so at least from this first teaser we're going to say all eyes on me it looks like it has a lot of potential 
Well, speaking of potential, let's move on to the actual planned out movie talk that we had today. And I'll throw it back to Natasha for our first story. All right. Our first story is Indiana Jones 5 will hit theaters on July 19th, 2019. And franchise star Harrison Ford will be 76 years old. But that doesn't mean the fifth movie in the franchise will spell a certain doom for the famous archaeologist. After so many rumors of a reboot and casting replacements, Steven Spielberg confirmed in March that he will be returning to direct the movie with Ford in the starring role once again. And while the filmmaker has two other movies to make before then, he's already teasing the story as part of an in-depth profile of the director over at THR. The filmmaker suggested that the fans will respond to Indiana Jones 5 better than they did the much maligned Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. He also promised that there will be no indie death scene a la Star Wars The Force Awakens, saying, I'm super excited about Indiana Jones 5. I think this one is straight down the pike for the fans. The one thing I will tell you is I'm not killing off Harrison Ford at the end of it. Mark, what do you think about Spielberg's comments about Indiana Jones 5? Well, I'm happy because I'm a huge fan of Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones. And maybe I'm a weirdo. Maybe I'm an outlier. I never like seeing my heroes die, even when it so is perfect for the story. And it serves a character arc. And it brings a finality to these series of adventures we've had since 1981. I don't want to see Indiana Jones die. If there's going to be an end to Harrison Ford playing Indiana Jones, I think there's other ways, perhaps even more creative, that you can do it besides having him try to outrun a boulder and he just can't quite get the old bones moving fast enough. That doesn't sound like a fair ending to Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones was always a guy who would get himself into these crazy things where the, the odds are so stacked against him and there's no possible way he's going to survive. But he had that smile, he had that charm, he had that whip, and somehow he would get himself and all of his loved ones most of his loved ones out of the way just in the nick of time so I don't know how that guy would ever die unless it's from natural causes and to be honest with you I don't really want to see Indiana Jones slowly withering away Harrison Ford proved as his turn in Han Solo which you know we can talk about that ending as well that he is still able to commit to a role that he's played from way in the past so I love this idea that Indiana Jones is not going to be killed off in Indy 5 Jason how about you I disagree completely. <laughs> I look, I've said for years that I always thought the way that they should have continued Indiana Jones is just like James Bond. Mm -hmm. They should have just recasted the part and like kept giving us serial adventures because there's so many mystical and mythological items out there right. that you could have Indiana Jones go after. I thought for years Hugh Jackman would have made an amazing uh, successor to Harrison Ford, but obviously they are settled on we got to stay with Harrison Ford. So for me, I don't need more Indiana Jones in my life, so if you're gonna give me more Indiana Jones, then I wanna see Indy's final adventure. Now, he doesn't have to die in this final adventure, Thank but, you. but this, <laughs> this, there should have some finality to it. Like, he should either get stuck in some mystical realm that we've never heard of with Marion, or he should maybe live with the space aliens that he made in the previous movie. <laughs> I'm not saying that, don't listen to this, Steven, but, you know, I, I don't know, there should be some finality to this, and to me, I honestly would hope he would take a risk and just kill him off. Like, I, I've got the perfect way to end this. All right. You get Shia LaBeouf come up. He's like, I need, I need to know something. He just stabs him. They're on that bridge. He just kills him. No, very I'm just Shakespearean. Kidding. I'm just kidding. This is very too much like <laughs> Force Awakens. I was going to say, it ends with him retiring and goes segues right into young Indiana Jones. Because if you remember, young Indiana mm -hmm. Jones takes place of the old Indiana Jones telling these young kids at a museum stories about his adventures. And I think that would just be like a really nice way to end it with, with Harrison Ford. He's going to be like 78 or 79, yeah. maybe 80 by the time this movie comes out. He's at a museum. A bunch of kids walk up to him, and he tells them some tale of amazing adventure. That's at the end of the movie. I think that would be a great way to send him off and not leave that bitter taste of the crystal skull and all that the horror. That's not even a movie to me. I only It's a trilogy mm, no, right now. Yeah, I'm yeah, never going to see that yeah, fourth yeah. one again. So in Indy's words, it does not belong in a museum. No. It does like not belong in a museum. Like the first three do, and like Indiana Jones was, the young Indiana Jones show in the early 90s that Schnepp's referring to, it was kind of funny because week after week you would see mm -hmm. an old Indiana Jones. I think he had an eye patch, mm -hmm. and he would just come up and accost some kid. What yeah. is it? A museum or is it a dentist <laughs> office? He'd be like, "Hey, you ever tell you a story about yep. Coronado's yeah. Cross?" The kid's Where like, "Where are you oh, going, right, kid? Fine. I this got another again. tale." <laughs> yeah. But look, Harrison Ford is going to be seventy-six, right? Yeah. When when this movie takes place, so he is not going to have the the action ability that he did in his youth in the eighties right. when these movies were great. So, Jason, I don't think that you and I are that far apart in our opinion about where this new movie should go. Mm -hmm. 
if you have a young Indiana Jones, let's say you wanted to throw Chris Pratt in there or Bradley Cooper, sure. just for argument's mm-hmm. sake. Let's say you wanted to put Schnepp in there as a younger Indiana Ooh, Jones. Totally. Schnepp. That's the way to do it. If you have Harrison <laughs> Ford, and maybe he is retelling his adventure. Maybe he's he, he he's writing a memoir. You know, maybe he's he's reading yeah. him and Marion's grandkid uh, 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 some story to sleep, and he's telling them about this adventure he went on. That way, we get the new Indiana Jones, a lot like what they did with River Phoenix in The Last Crusade. Yeah. Right. And then from that point on, in subsequent movies, we have an Indiana Jones who we already have kind of accepted, hopefully better than Shia LaBeouf. Well, I mean, here's another spin that you could do is like, you know, it's not Indiana Jones, but taking a little take from Raiders of the Lost Ark, it could be Indiana Jones and the Raiders of something, something. It's a gang that he mm-hmm. uh, forms of other archeo- like adventure archaeologists. Mm. And then even though Indiana Jones is retiring, the next movie could be like the Raiders of the, and it's his friends. I'd be down with that. Like, you know, like you pass the torch, but not with his weird son, Muff. No, you make it the son of Salah. Hey, that would be amazing. I'm down <laughs> yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. I don't Spielberg, hate that idea. Spielberg, listen to our ideas, and John, man. John Come Reese on. Davies is like the weird uh, Elliot Gould of this Raiders group. Right? Yeah. I would love to see a young, a, like a younger group of archaeologists mm-hmm. who are kind of in training with him, and he's like, you wouldn't even know what you're going to experience, and they go on some crazy yeah. adventure with him. Jason, do you think that this movie has a little bit less pressure on it because we did get the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and we know that this this franchise is now mortal, and we're hoping for a Return to Glory, but if not, we've kind of already accepted our. Fate. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. I. I I think this movie has the same um, kind of bar litmus test as Force Awakens did, mm. because before Force Awakens, we had the prequels. And right. so we were like, they just have to be better than the prequels. We're going to go into this movie being like, it just has to be better than Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. So the the sad fact about this is that he could still deliver us another clunker of an Indiana Jones movie. But because it's slightly better than Crystal Skull, we're like, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> At least it wasn't the Crystal Skull yeah, exactly. is what you'll be saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what the goal would be. And I yeah. hate defending Shia LaBeouf character but his name is not Muff it's Mutt Mutt it's, a, All it's, right. a, it's just too close letters, but it's actually a world <laughs> pretty of close okay. Mark I was pretty close <laughs> you, you made a hell of an effort <laughs> sir and your shirt is great Thank you. what's our next story <laughs> Natasha after famously lobbying for a role in the Fast and Furious franchise Helen Mirren revealed in an interview with Elle magazine that her efforts have paid off Speaking about her latest project, Eye in the Sky, and how much she wants her roles in film to be relevant and serious, she then went on to reveal her part in the fa- in the eighth Fast and Furious franchise, saying, but that's for the fun of it. Adding that she's always rather loved driving in order for her to join the film, she told the filmmakers that she would only do it if she was allowed to ev- actually drive the car if the story and character <laughs> yes. called for it. Fans of Mirren and the Fast and Furious franchise will be crossing their fingers, hoping she'll be behind the wheel of a muscle car in director F. Gary Gray's Fast 8 when it comes to theater on April 14th, 2017. Schnepp, what do you think about Helen Mirren in Fast 8? I love this casting. I love Helen Mirren from Excalibur. If you've never seen her playing Morgana <laughs> Le Fay, Al Nathrock, you got to see that. You got to see the cook, his, the, his, the thief, his wife, and her lover. She's got so many incredible mm-hmm. movies. She can do no wrong. Whenever she's in a movie, even if it's crap and trash, she elevates it. She is awesome. I can't wait to see her drive some insane car really fast. And she's no stranger to these kind of movies. She's really good in Red. red. I mean, when you watch that, it's like, oh, wow, Helen Mirren, she can beat some people up. She Mm -hmm. still has it. And I think she'd be one of the few people on earth that I would pay to go rescue Indiana Jones if he did get in trouble. (laughs) She could be an Indiana Jones. She'd be awesome. She She, could be. And you know what? She gets a great test when this movie comes out, uh, I guess, next year. So, Shep, you make a great point. She's a credit to any cast that she's in, regardless of the genre of film and Jason I gotta be honest with you not only was I excited to see Helen Mirren in Fast 8 that's a great headline but also seeing her say I kind of want to get behind the wheel of a muscle car and <laughs> you know, let's, let, let's, let's, uh, let's let Miss Daisy drive the car and see how yeah, that goes I think that's amazing the only problem with that is I think that it may limit some of the scenes she's in because they may not let her do some of the crazier stunts right. that might limit her time but her saying that I want to drive these cars to me makes her the hottest and most badass woman in Hollywood. Yes. <laughs> Helen Mirren, right now, we're staying it right now. Um, I also hope this opens up the crazy possibilities about where the Fast and the Furious franchise could go. Mm-hmm. Like, is there a possibility that we could have a cameo by uh, Dame Judi Dench? Right. In this, oh, let's hey. open up the British gates. Here comes Ian McKellen, you know? <laughs> let's yeah. do it. There is, oh my God, th- I th- This is a pipeline, and, and it is something they explored, and, and I'm not that, you know, I, I hesitate a little to compare Kurt Russell to Helen 
Marilyn Marin, but when Kurt <laughs> Russell agreed to be in this movie, it's like, well, yes, he's a he's an action star and he's sure. been around forever as well. But you bring him in, and it's like they are adding a level of class or sophistication to these movies. And Natasha, when you see that Helen Mirren is going to be in this, it does add a touch of elegance oh, to mm -hmm. Fast Eight, right? Absolutely. I want to see her going like 200 miles per mm -hmm. hour in her sick sports car and just like kicking ass in this movie and just with her British accent and all. It'll be great. <laughs> I think that, uh, that I was already excited to see this movie because I think it's going to be mm -hmm. silly fun like yeah. most of these other films are and this yeah. only heightens my... I even hope there's a romantic subplot where she <laughs> denies Vin Diesel. Ooh. And she goes with The Rock. She goes with The Rock. I was like, what is she going to play? Is she going to play, play a bad lady? Is she going to oh. play a cop? Is she with Hobbs? How are they gonna I don't know, man. There's her? so many possibilities. Yeah. I think all of them are vying for her wiles and I don't think, I think she rejects all of them to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we'll bring in like a Michael Caine or somebody like that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what? You know, and Michael Caine would be appropriate because of Git Carter and all those totally. series and yeah. all those series that he used to do. So I mean, he would be a great cameo for this series too. We Definitely. are writing some great movies <laughs> here. There are just some great creative juices flowing on the desk Fast and Furious today. producers are just eavesdropping on this. And by the way, Helen Mirren, you're totally welcome to come here and be a guest on the show. Yeah. We're on a roll so far with movie talk. All right, Natasha, hit me. Okay, according to a report from Variety, Zac Efron is in talks to team up with Hugh Jackman in the Fox biopic of Barnum & Bailey circus founder P.T. Barnum called The Greatest Showman on Earth. Jackman has been attached to the project since 2009 and is a contemporary musical set to be scripted by Sex and the City writer Jenny Bix. Jackman will play the showman with a speciality in hoaxing the gullible public as he creates the three-ring Barnum & Bailey circus that made him famous. Barnum gained fame in the 19th century with tours of Tom Thumb and the singer Jenny Lind. He began calling it the greatest show on earth near the end of his career. Fox is hoping to make this a priority and gear up for production should Efron's deal close. Jason, what do you think about Zac Efron and Hugh Jackman together for The Greatest Showman on Earth? When I first heard about this movie, I was really unsure. Mm -hmm. And then I heard that Hugh Jackman was producing and starring in it. And he has a musical background. This is gonna be a musical. Yeah. Uh, Zac Efron has a musical background. And I'm like, okay, Barnum and Bailey as a musical, I'm in. I think this sounds like a lot of fun. I hope they embrace the cheese of like the sort of vaudevillian era and all yeah. this stuff and like, oh, look, the elephant can stand on its legs. Um, I also think it would be a mistake if they didn't seek out Tony winner Lin Manuel of Hamilton mm. to have some part of this as well, <laughs> right. because I think I think just pack this thing full of musical cameos. Like let's throw Jack Black in there. Let's sure. throw oh every person with a musical talent in Hollywood into this movie. Make it a little cheesy. Make it a little fun. I'm in. It's so interesting you bring up the name Jack Black because that's also the name that that popped in my head when I read this story because he, like Hugh Jackman, can be is such a great showman and presenter that you would think that in an alternate universe, maybe not so much alternate for Jack Black that they would be the great lead singer yeah. of a band when they are the front man. And hearing that Zac Efron is going to be a part of this, I think it's a good career move for him. I'm not ready to be like, oh, now I'm seeing this movie. <laughs> I mean, Jackman, yeah, okay, but you got me Efron, sweet. I need to see a little more from him. But I have seen enough to say he's not going to uh, be, you know, he's not going to dampen this project mm -hmm. or the excitement I would have for it. It sounds like a great role for Hugh Jackman. Zac Efron is somebody that does have acting chops. He can be funny. He can be dramatic. So it's not a problem for me having him in this movie. I like the sound of this so far. How about you, Schnapp? I love the idea of this. I mean, musicals are hit or miss sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, they're more, I think, miss than they are hit. When you get a rare musical that's fantastic, that's when it blows up and kind of revives the other genre. This has those, those possibilities because of Hugh Jackman and his amazing ability. He's like such a showman. Like, he's he made those Oscars, uh, you know, watchable yeah. when, he ran, when he ran that. Not just the Wolverine song, but all that <laughs> stuff. So, I mean, I think, you know, and he was a standout in Lim Is. So, it's like, you know, I think him being P.T. Barnum, is, it, is Zac Efron gonna play Bailey? Is that already, because I didn't see that in the description, but I guess that would make sense. He's gonna be the other half. He's right? playing the tiger, and it's, right. it's, it's like, all motion yeah, he's a, Or I the thought he's just in like a weird tiger plush and animal thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a really different take on P.T. Barnum. They're all like fluffies, you know, like walking around. You know, and this um, was a new form of entertainment when when Barnum and Bailey were doing the circuses oh, totally. early on. I mean, people had no, they, they, they it blew their minds that you could actually have mm -hmm. a traveling circus and show up with all these animals and all these performers. So seeing the genesis of that, hopefully it's a little bit better done than what Water for Elephants was, which also <laughs> harkened back to those days. But like, I gotta say, as a, as a kid in the 70s, 
Barnum and Bailey Circus was still a big thing. Mm -hmm. I remember going and my parents got me the program and it was like, it was a big event and it slowly phased out just like the Harlem Globetrotters. Like after mm -hmm. like the seventies and into the eighties, other forms of entertainment came in. But I just remember as a little kid, like being really excited to go to the Barnum and Bailey Circus. So See, from just, what, from what yeah. you said there, like that kind of makes me think that with this movie, they should think about doing some sort of a, like a road show. Like mm -hmm. they should like open it up in like these older theaters, like come out and do an opening number or whatever, you know, give you peanuts and stuff like that show the movie and then do a closing number like make it an experience or a thing I guarantee I, you they'll probably do that for the press at least the press at least junket. the press the yeah. press <laughs> junket's gonna get a three ring party that sounds pretty yes. awesome I wanna sit on an elephant yes. watching this movie oh man that would be incredible <laughs> that's what I wanna see happen something else I wanna see happen is I wanna throw it over to Wendy because she's been monitoring the chat room since we started the show Wendy we have the, the show menus but I also wanna go back to our lead story about Indiana Jones not being killed off in part five and then let's talk some Helen Mirren as well all right well let's go all the way up to our breaking news which is Tupac uh, today's his birthday apparently and Ken Dog says I really dug the voice over of Tupac's mom during the teaser the actor looks almost exactly like him too hopefully they handle this like straight out of Compton instead of notorious for the Indiana Jones 5 movie most of the chat doesn't want to believe that Harrison Ford is actually 76 years old <laughs> I think he looks great for his age some didn't think that his death was handled well in The Force Awakens, and they're glad that he's not going to be killed in Indy 5. Helen Mirren in Fast 8. A lot of the chat is quite excited about this. Tyrus SQW says, goodness, she's going to kick so much ass. And Theo Source says, awesome, Helen Mirren will be the hottest chick in the franchise. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And finally, for the uh, Zac Efron and Hugh Jackman for The Greatest Showman on Earth, not everyone is on board with this movie. They seem to be turned off by the Sex and the City writers being attached to this. What? But the that chat can good. agree that the casting choices <laughs> make sense. And Michael uh, Maribal says, kind of reminds me of The Prestige, which is definitely a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, we want to remind you guys as well, just up on the Collider Video channel was a trailer reaction to the new teaser, All Eyes on Me, the Tupac movie, and that is with our own Dennis Zane and Mark Riley. So make sure you guys check it out. They watched the trailer, they reacted to it live, then they gave you their thoughts. Click on that at any time. Now it's time for Buy or Sell. This is the part of the show where Natasha is going to give us a premise, and then Schnepp, myself, and Inman are all going to throw elbows defending our choice. Okay, the Crow remake has been seemingly cursed for the last few years, with a rotating door of actors who then leave the project, like Luke Evans, Tom Hiddleston, James McAvoy, Bradley Cooper, and Jack Huston. There's a similar chain of directors that do the same, including Stephen Norrington, Juan Carlos Fresnadillo, F. Javier Gutierrez, and more recently, Corin Hardy, who was fired off the project by producer Ed Pressman amid a legal battle between the studio and filmmakers. Now, thanks to a report from Deadline, it looks as though Corin Hardy might end up directing the movie after all. Sources for Deadline say that there might be a thaw in the battle for the remake, and Hardy could be back in the director's chair, though the report notes that there still are obstacles to overcome, and another studio may step into the mix as an active partner. But it's the first update on the remake in a while, showing that there is, in fact, some movement on the movie, so fans of The Crow should be optimistic. Mark, buy or sell a Crow remake ever getting off the ground? I... <laughs> Are you tired of talking about yeah. the crow, Mark? Oh, well, this is your favorite subject. Jeez. Yeah, I would. We were just I would, talking about I would rather go outside in the parking lot, get a bunch of gunpowder, and try to light it on fire, and see if I can make the crow mm -hmm. with my and, and just film it, than talk about another remake, possibly, maybe, sort of, kind of happening. It's a movie news story, so we're going to banter about it, but I'm so sick of hearing that the crow, oh, now we have a director. Oh, it's the same director that was on it. Oh, but then there were some studio conflicts. Now he's off it. But, but maybe they had lunch together and they split the bill and everybody left his <laughs> friends. So I think eventually a crow remake is going to happen. I don't see it happening in the immediate future. And moreover, I think that I'm really tired of hearing that it might happen. Don't announce any more news until we actually know that it's until moving. Until after, sure. until after principal yeah. photography has ended. I am That's complaining. What I, I wish yeah. the sidebar wasn't drinking so much and it didn't put the crow story on there, but we're talking about it. So, Schnepp, do you buy or sell that we're eventually going to get a crow remake? You know what I buy? Uh, I, just two things I want to say. Um, 
It's weird. Like in the early 2000s, every super had to light their logo on fire. Yeah. There was like Daredevil. Yeah. There was the Punisher. Mm -hmm. There was even Batman did yeah. it. I mean, yeah. Which the crow. takes a lot of practice. Like how many yeah. crimes do you have to foil before you actually get? I'm sure the first couple of times the crow tried that. It looked all weird. Yeah. They're like, <laughs> is like, that the, a penis? No, yeah. that's a crow. Yeah, I'm a, sorry. The wing isn't supposed to be broken like that. I got to do it again. <laughs> yeah, hang on. Hang on. Like he's redoing it. Just go, go back. Um, <laughs> Walk back in the building. Yeah. It looks like Batman. So it's supposed to be a crow <laughs> i gotta say i just watched uh alex Preuss is the crow like uh, two weeks ago i love that movie i see mm -hmm. it on, you know at least a couple at once every couple years it's yeah. a fantastic film it's it's still it still stands up and uh that's kind of it as far as the crow goes i mean they made a sequel with another dude in it um Didn't they make like multiple they like, made multiple ones. I'm saying direct direct the, the crow yeah. 2 city of angels is what it was called yeah, it was, yeah. uh pope was actually became but there's the one director. like david boreanaz as the crow too that's like the fourth or fifth okay. one <laughs> kristen dunce is in one yeah, of them the yeah. kid from terminator whatever his name was nick stalls no no the, the first terminator or oh. the second terminator he, Edward Furlong? Yes, Erlock, Edward Furlong played the crow <laughs> in one of them. Wow. Uh, those are all the movies. Then they did a TV series. And then they've been talking about doing a movie now for like 10 years. And it's like, you're right. They have a countless list of actors and directors who are just you know, funneling through. I don't know if this is going to be like Superman. Like it took like 19 years yeah. to make another Superman movie. And they were like, by the time before they shot anything, they had spent like $130 million or something. I don't know if that's going to be like the crow. I think they probably spent about mm -hmm. 400 grand maybe uh, with the 10 years of development. Cause you have to pay people that writers and this. I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of tired of talking about it. I love the crow. I love the idea of the crow. I love the comic book. So I'd like to see Eric Draven return in a good way. I know they're talking about this crow version being a lot darker and more like a horror movie. So if they could do it, I'd love to see that happen. But you're right. I'm really tired of talking about it. Yeah. Once this thing mm -hmm. flaps its broken wings back into the theater, <laughs> I might be really excited to check it yeah. out if that's where it ends up landing or if they do a Netflix mm -hmm. series or something else, because you can do a lot of different sorts of projects with this mythology that I am a big fan of, but I'm just tired mm -hmm. of all these, oh, we might remake it, then we're not gonna remake it. So I'm gonna throw a number at you, Jason. I'm gonna throw a year at you. Okay. Before the dawn of 2019, mm -hmm. do you buy or sell that we're gonna get a Crow remake in theaters? Sell. Okay. I don't think we see it before 2019. Mm. I think I think we'll see it by 2025. Okay. Whoa! <laughs> I, no, yeah. I didn't give you six nope. more yeah. years nope. to play. No, with. no, 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 no. I, I'm with Jason <laughs> yep. with the added bonus six year, <laughs> the six year plan. I could get behind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We stand behind the crow that's six right. year plan. Right. Uh, Technically, that's two. ten years because 2020 is like yeah. the leap year zero year. No, so. I, I, you actually had me intrigued when you said Netflix. Like mm. as soon as you said Netflix, if you could do a, like a crow series, like the style of like Daredevil or wow. Jessica Jones. I'd be in, but yeah, like a movie. I also am of the opinion that there are certain movies that like you just don't remake, and The Crow for me kind of falls into that. Like, okay, we've got the perfect Crow movie, so you'll never beat it. So right. why try to remake it? You know, Blade Runner. I'm speaking to you. <laughs> um, so let's just go Netflix. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that when we hear about this kind of story again, maybe and probably hopefully it'll be on TV talk instead of movie talk, because yeah. that's where I think this property could see the most fruit bear. But you know what? I'll, I'll say this. Like, I'm a big Blade Runner is one of my all time favorite films. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to seeing a Blade Runner 2 or whatever they're going to call it, because it's taking place years later. It's mm -hmm. not a reboot. It's a sequel. And if it sucks, I'll still have the original, just like the Matrix. To me, yeah, there's totally. only one Matrix. The other two are just like, <laughs> you know, weird versions of it, something else. But I still have that first movie that I love. So if they make they've made countless crow versions of different mm -hmm. crows and I still have that original crow movie. And as long as the film, the films that are made that are stand the test of time are those films that it, no matter how many remakes or reboots or sequels there are, you always have that original. You know? OK, well, look, I, I'm, and I apologize to everybody out there watching into the panel. I kicked off this segment with a sour attitude, I was in a bad mood. It's okay, talk Mark. About the crow again, but here's what I'm going to say, is that the next story I'm sure is going to be all sunshine and roses. So Natasha, please cheer me up with our next buy or sell. Yeah, there's like butterflies coming out of the screen right now oh, about good. to talk oh, about this oh, next oh. story. According to a report from Variety, New Line is developing a Conjuring 2 spinoff movie, The Nun, based on the demonic <laughs> character scene in last weekend's Conjuring sequel. The studio has tapped David Leslie Johnson, who co-wrote Conjuring 2 with Chad 
Chad and Carrie Hayes to write the script. Producers are James Wan, who directed the two Conjuring movies and produced the sequel, and Peter Safran, who produced both movies. The demon nun came to life in The Conjuring 2 in a painting by Patrick Wilson's paranormal investigator, Ed Warren, and later attacked Vera Farmiga's Lorraine Warren character. No director or actors have been set. Schnepp, buy or sell a spinoff based on The Nun from The Conjuring 2. First of all, you got to get Marilyn Manson to play The Nun, because that's exactly <laughs> what The Nun looks like. I was like, man, that is a frightening version of Marilyn Manson in the most positive and creative way that I could possibly say. I love this, because... Uh, you know, after I saw the movie, it felt like, wow, there's a lot of, it felt like there were almost too many creatures in there. And then, but I loved all of them, but it felt a little like jammed up. And then I read that James Wan had come up with this character of the nun after they had finished principal photography and added it in the reshoots. He was like, look, originally it was going to be like a, a horned demon was the, the creature. And he's mm -hmm. like, I've got this idea. It's a freaky, I don't know if he said a freaking Marilyn Manson looking like nun that floats around in paintings and stuff. And they did all that in the reshoots. And man, did that just put that movie over the edge because all the scenes that that nun is in are frightening and freaky and weird and it builds up that tension as to you don't know when that character is going to show up again. So I originally thought, oh, they'll probably go with a Crooked Man, you know, spin off uh, like an Annabelle thing. But man, the nun, I never I didn't even see that coming. So I'm super happy. To, I can't wait to be scared by that freaky thing again. Oh, I saw it coming. I still see it coming every night around <laughs> 3 a.m. This nun attacks me. It haunts my dreams. It haunts my reality. And I buy this big time because this nun is terrifying. It's the second scariest nun for everyone keeping score in cinema history. The honor for first scariest nun ever still goes to the one from Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Her first name is Amanda. Watch the movie. She is is horrifying. She's not even trying to be horrifying. She just is a scary. Nuns are scary <laughs> looking, okay? Sure. I went to Catholic school for the better part of my <laughs> educational life, and a lot of them were very, very kind to me. Some of them weren't. A lot of them were cool to me, but just the way the habit falls, yeah. and sometimes, even the nun in Nightmare on Elm Street 3, she's not wearing the, the, the classic black, and she's wearing all <laughs> white. It's like the away nun uniform, and it is terrifying to look at. This nun was the scariest thing about The Conjuring 2. So if you see the first Conjuring, you're like, man, there's a lot of scary stuff, and then you you see, hey, what's that doll in that mm -hmm. room? We should make a movie about that. That's what they did with Annabelle. And I think that when you see The Conjuring 2, there's a lot of scary crap in there. Yeah. You see The Nun, and that's the one that stands that out. That painting scene make that they that talk about. Off. I was going to say The Blues Brothers. What's the scariest part of that movie? The Nun. <laughs> yeah, The Nuns. What's nuns the scariest scary. part I'm about? Di I'm disappointed that nobody brought up Sally Fields as the flying nun. Ooh! Oh, that's nuns can fly. In a I mean, way. how does she fly? That's <laughs> <No>. scary. <laughs> Because she's Ask a nun. your parents about that reference. <laughs> That's right. Do you buy or sell this news, Jason? Uh, I'll buy it. I have not seen The Conjuring 2, but I've heard nothing but positive things about this. And this kind of reminds me of the news we heard from Warner Brothers a couple weeks ago where they were like, let's make that Harley Quinn movie. Like, this actually gets me enthused because it's a studio being like, this part of the movie really worked. Mm -hmm. Let's let's make more of that. Let's yeah. make this, let's let's focus on that character. And that this seems like a good thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll tell you this. I didn't think The Conjuring 2 is as good as the first one. I still enjoyed it as a horror movie a right. lot. And the Nun was the standout to me. Natasha, do nuns scare you as much as they scare the three grown men on this <laughs> campus? <laughs> nuns are scary. I also went to Catholic school for like pretty much my whole life and they're totally nice, but yeah, there's something about them and their like dark habit and just, I just feel like they know. They know everything that goes on in that whole other world. They but know they know everything. <laughs> everything. Um, I haven't seen The Conjuring 2 yet. I want to so badly because I love the, con the first Conjuring. Um, I didn't see Annabelle actually either. So I don't know. What, was that received? Well, I don't think I remember hearing I don't that think it was that good. I, if you want to sit down and get scared for a night, Annabelle's fine. But I would go see The Conjuring 2 in a theater because that's the way to see a horror movie. Yeah. And it's a good, scary yeah. time in the theater. So that's what I wouldn't want to see is like a really scary character in this movie just kind of like fall flat. That, but I don't think it will because I think it's going to kind of keep on going with the hype. Oh, just yeah. The, just the image of the yeah. creepy new Maryland I mean, Manson just that. Nuns. <laughs> that image right there. Yeah, that in a hallway is like, She's I'll see that movie. She's tall and scary. <laughs> it kind of no. floats around and I shows up I see the Maryland you. Manson comparisons. Yeah. Though, looking at yeah. that picture back there. You're going to have fun <laughs> in the theater uh, and then afterwards you're going to look in your in your rearview mirror and you're going to see the nun <laughs> sitting in the back seat. Just put on the dope show and just start rocking that up. Crank the music up and be like, let's go, nun. And the nun starts jamming out. It's all good. Sweet dreams are definitely not 
made of that, but they are of this next story because we might get a trilogy. What's up, Natasha? Earlier this month, Collider reported that the Sicario sequel had received a title, Soldado, along with the new director, Stefano Salima, who directed the Italian miniseries Gamora. In the report, it was learned that Josh Brolin and Benicio Del Toro would also return, and the story would focus on Del Toro's mysterious character. Now, in an interview with The Independent, Salima has provided new details about what he has planned, not just for Soldado, including plans, but including plans for a third movie. Salima starred, started by saying that the idea is to make three anthology movies with some of the core actors and set it in the same world. In describing the plan, Salima said, it's not a real sequel, it's absolutely a standalone movie, a completely different story with just two of the characters that you met in Sicario. The reason that I love Soldado is because it's not exactly a sequel, it's something you can catch and enjoy even if you haven't watched the first one. In speaking about the sequel and who we would be following now that Emily Blunt's character will not be returning, he said, the antagonists are now absolutely the main characters. As for taking over the reins from original director Denis Villeneuve, Salima says, I loved Sicario. I feel the movie was quite similar to my approach, so to me, I'm just shooting another movie. Soldado will be much more cinematic than Sicario was. It's got an incredible amount of huge action sequences in there. It will be a different journey in the same world. Even the theme is different. It's not drug dealing. It's more on immigration. No release date has been set for either Soldado or for a third movie in the th series. Jason, buy or sell a Sicario 3 before the second is even released. I'm going to buy this with some hesitation, though, mm -hmm. because we have a different director. We're talking about the third movie before the second. We've even seen the second movie. Uh, we don't know who's going to direct the third movie yet, right? Correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, there's a little bit of a worry um, that this could kind of become true detective in movie form. I love Sicario. I thought it was great. I thought it was a fantastic movie. One of the better movies I saw last year. But True Detective season one, if you remember, was great. And I know this is not TV talk, but also did an anthology thing for its second season. Sure. Second season, uh, what I thought was just fine, not well received at all. And I worry that Soldado could be the same thing for Sicario, that it could be, people are gonna compare it to Sicario. They're gonna treat right. it as Sicario 2 no matter what you do. Right. And even though it's not Sicario 2, that's how everybody's gonna look at it. And so it's immediately gonna be compared to that. And I don't think it'll ever live, it may not never live up to it. Well, you, you make a lot of great points, but what's interesting is that I do buy this news because Sicario Soldado is not a direct sequel mm -hmm. to Sicario. If they were gonna do that, then I would be like, well, let's just pump the brakes and see how the next <laughs> movie is right. before we get a third one. But if you are talking about an anthology and it's different stories that are all similar in the same world and they all have that feel that tone then I'm gonna get excited mm -hmm. about that because like you I thought the first Sicario was a terrific movie it got its claws into me and it was an interesting point that the director made about how this new one might be a little more cinematic with bigger action scenes I thought I was gonna get that from Sicario ended up not getting it ended up not needing it because when I did see the tension rise mm -hmm. it wasn't all about slam bang action it was more about how you would actually feel if you were in a situation that tense and that suspenseful so you hear Emily Blunt's not coming back and it's like well what are you gonna do we're not going to have more adventures with Emily Blunt. No, it's going to be something different, but set in the same universe. I like this news a lot, Schnepp. Yeah, you know, for me, I originally sold the idea because when they announced it, I'm like, what are they going to, why would they bring Emily Blunt back? Sicario is one and done. It's actually like an old school movie. It has mm -hmm. a beginning, middle, end. It's a, to me, it wasn't built for sequels. And Emily Blunt's story ended where it ended with the movie. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I felt it was a betrayal of the original film if they were like, oh, now she's coming back. It'd be like, you know, I'm <laughs> not she's coming. Got a kid. I'm not coming back to the theater. <laughs> F you, you know. But uh, seeing that, I think it's different than uh, you know, like anthology shows like American Horror Story yeah. or like you said, uh, True Detective, because they're bringing the main characters back. They, mm -hmm. Not Emily Blunt, but the other characters played by Josh Brolin and uh, Del Toro. So I mean, those characters are also in Sicario. So it do, it will be. It won't be like a totally different. It'll be following those same characters because Emily Blunt's story ended, but mm -hmm. theirs did not. So I do I do buy the idea of a Sicario 2 or Soldado. What I don't buy is the director's comments that, you know, it's going to be much more cinematic because I thought Sicario was incredibly cinematic. Uh, cinematic to me doesn't mean a giant budget with a bunch of dudes running towards each other. I think, you know, there's different ways you could look at the terminology of cinematic. It was incredibly cinematic when they're in those drug caves walking around. And with it was Roger Deakins, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, was yeah, incredible yeah. cinematography. So I find, I find his comments a little big headed 
lightheaded, you know, let's wait and see. I don't really care about action scenes unless they're really well done. So now you just put some pressure on yourself, son. Mm. Uh, Soldado, I'm waiting for you, but I am waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you also put some pressure on yourself when you announce a third movie, yeah. whether it's an anthology or a direct yeah. sequel yeah. before we even get a chance to see the second right. one. But I think and the third one's going to be way more cinematic, Mark. Just got to tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just mention yeah. that. It's going to be bigger I and more cinematic. I love the first Sicario. Ours is going to be bigger, better. Yeah. Yeah. You're and, he, and, better. and if he doesn't pull it off, they're going to be like, you're the guy that killed the Sicario trilogy. Right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, we can't even make the third one because yours wasn't cinematic <laughs> enough. Yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, there, Wendy, there is a fish out there that either has a horrible memory or way too high of a THC level. Before we talk about <laughs> Dory, let's talk about the buyer cells that we just had and what the chat room's saying about them. Sure, for the Crow remake, uh, a lot of sell for this. Pablo Gocher says, sell, we already have an awesome Crow movie. Stop and just let it go. And Lily Musai says, is there still an audience for the Crow to warn a remake? I agree that it would make a great series on Netflix, but as a film, sell. For The Conjuring 2 spin-off with The Nun, I'm seeing both buy and sell for this. Benjamin Workman says, sell, 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 just give us Conjuring 3. And hmm. Senpei Kist says, this makes sense for the studio. They did learn from Annabelle. They learned that they can print money with this franchise. And Chris Robinson says, The Crooked Man would have made for a much better spin-off. Finally, for the third Sicario movie, initially seeing buys for this, then I started to see the sales trickle in. John Mabley says, if they can carry a good, meaningful story through three, then buy. And Dan Allen says, Benicio Del Toro was the best part of that film, in my opinion, and I definitely want to see more of his character. Mm -hmm. Natasha, let's move from the drug war that's happening between the United States and Mexico and move on to the ocean with the very cute movie coming out this weekend. Yay! Finding Dory is finally here. Dory, voiced by Ellen DeGeneres, is a wide-eyed blue tank fish who suffers from memory loss every 10 seconds or so. The one thing she can remember is that she somehow became separated from her parents as a child. With help from her friends Nemo and Marlin, Dory embarks on an epic adventure to find them. Her journey begins her to the or her journey brings her to the Marine Life Institute, a conservatory that houses diverse ocean species. Dory now knows that her family reunion will only happen if she can save her mom and dad from captivity. Oh, well, it sounds like a cute story. It also sounds like a sequel. So the question is, hey, is Pixar just trying to get our money based on the name and the love that we all have for Finding Nemo? Or is Finding Dory going to be a different kind of story and still have some familiar notes from the movie that we all appreciate from years ago? And I think this film did its job marvelously. I loved Finding Dory. Love, uh, it's you know what I did love it. It's not a perfect movie, and I don't think it's quite as good as Finding Nemo. But I laughed a lot watching this movie. I got a little bit of those emotional tugs on the heartstrings. Though I will say thank you, Pixar, for not entirely ripping my heart out and showing it to me <laughs> like you have done in some other movies. Up to name one, I thought Finding Dory was fantastic, and I would definitely recommend if you're a family, if you're a kid, if you're an adult like me that just loves to go see a great adventure with a lot of laughs, Finding Dory is the right one for you. Jason, I know you got a chance to check this one out as well. How I you feel? I did. I loved it. I loved it. I, I disagree with you. I liked it better than the first one. Wow. Uh, I thought that this one had brought an emotional by focusing the movie on Dory. This had so much more of an emotional core and it added so much more depth to the movie than just a father son relationship. I was saying before the show started that I think this is going to be the movie that every special needs parent, every, every parent with a special needs kid is going to show their kid and be like, look, you can accomplish things. You can do things because that's the basic tone and theme of the movie. And, and you're just like, wow, is so many heartfelt moments. I do agree. There are a couple problems with it, but the emotional story took me through the movie better than Finding Nemo. Okay, Schnapp, you have not yet checked this picture out. Uh, is this something that you want to see opening weekend? How are you feeling about Miss Dory? I definitely want to see Finding Dory. I like what you just said. That mm -hmm. actually made me want to see it more now because the special needs aspect didn't really mm -hmm. hit me on it. But like when I was at the Superman celebration, there's a lot of people with autism and mm -hmm. special needs that come up and say hello to you. And they're having the time of their life and anything you could do to make them feel good or better is great. This so I can't is the, wait to see this This is film. the movie for them. Wow. Like, yeah. I definitely want to see it now. Yeah, I mean, Finding Dory, it's, and, and like, it, it's a high bar to match up to any Pixar movie. I mean, they, they, they consistently hit home runs, if not grand slams, with a couple singles in there, Brave. But overall, they get on base every time, and more often than not, they score a run. Natasha, I know you're a huge fan of Finding Nemo. Yes. Have you checked out Finding Dory yet? And is it something you're going to see this week? I have not seen any early screenings of Finding Dory, so I am absolutely seeing, this, um, seeing that movie this weekend. Um, 
Finding Nemo is my favorite Pixar movie and I loved Dory in it. And just you bringing that up, I mean, I can't really think about like the special needs kids aspect of it, but that Mm. already is making me like tear up on the side. Mm. So I'm super excited. I'm going to check it out with my family. Um, Yeah. And I think this is the sequel that I've been like totally excited for all year. So happy that it's finally here. No, it it lives up. Yeah. I would love to hear from everybody out there. Comment in the chat room or afterwards on YouTube. Who do you think is the best vocal casting in an animated film you've ever seen? Because Ellen DeGeneres is, is certainly up there. I think she's top 10, at least for me, because the way that she delivers a joke is in her real life and in her stand-up is so similar to the way that Dory you would expect a fish that has no short-term memory to talk. It's just it's such a perfect marriage between character and voiceover artist that it, it's one of the many appeals of Finding Dory. And if you guys want to check out our non-spoiler review of Finding Dory, you can do that. It's up on the Collider video channel right now. Myself, Dennis, and Perry Nemiroff all gave our scores and they were very positive. Check out our thoughts at any time. All right, let's move on to mailbag. Anytime you guys want to send us an email and potentially get it read on the show, just hit us up, collidervideo at gmail.com. And at the end of the show, we're going to save a little bit of time for your live Twitter questions. So go ahead and start tweeting us at Collider Video, and Natasha will get to as many as she possibly can. Natasha, what's up first in the mailbag? Okay, well, we've got a double doozy here on this <laughs> episode of a Mailbag. Um, Kyle Gritchell writes, Hey, Collider crew, what was the most awkward and uncomfortable movie you and your parents went to? Borat, when I was 10 with my dad, ended with some uncomfortable glares from other moviegoers. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I've told this story before, I think on Movie Talk or some right. other, I think I might have done it in stand-up for a while, but there is, I, I was turning, I don't know, I was turning that age, one of those ages when you're an adolescent, you know, you're 13 (laughs) or whatever. And it was my birthday. It was July 7th for everyone who wants to know. And I was very excited to go see the movie Species because, yeah, it's an alien adventure. (laughs) And it also happens to be a naked woman with a lot of slime on her for a lot of the movie. (laughs) Hey, I'm a boy. What do you want me to do? And so I got the whole family together. We were going to go see Species. The whole family. It's Mark's birthday. We played mini golf. (laughs) We got some nachos into his chubby gullet. And then we went to go see Species. The worst part of it was the whole family gets in the car and on the way to Species, we're going to pick up my dad from work and the look on my dad's face because that same summer, Apollo 13 came out and I'd already seen Apollo 13 and my dad thought, I guess there was a miscommunication. My mom told him we're going to see Apollo 13. He gets in the car and he's so ready to see Apollo 13 and I tell him we're seeing Species, just the look on his face like... Oh my God! This <laughs> this horny little fat bastard. You've is gonna disappointed keep me the boy <laughs> from seeing one of the most inspirational stories of my entire life, and now I'm gonna go see. I guess my dad got out of the movie okay. Right. I mean, Natasha Henstridge is nothing awful to look. There at, are parts for him to like. It was uh, <laughs> after the movie. It's like you just gotta walk out. And my family's like, we hope you enjoyed your birthday, Mark. July 8th is coming around very soon, and yeah. uh, nobody's gonna talk to Species you. Species <laughs> is on Blu-ray. They have a box set, one, two, and three. Natasha Henstridge is in the first two. Get that. For our our man right over here. <laughs> oh no, no I, I've seen enough. Species. Send him Blu-ray yeah, copies. Send him some Blu-rays yep. of species. <laughs> okay, well now I know what wow. a naked woman looks like. So <clears throat> I've seen other pictures. All right, wow. Jason, let's go to you. What's the most like awkward <sighs> movie-going experience you've had with your parents? Uh, you know, this is probably not very like like racy. It's not as racy as Species, definitely. But <laughs> I, I we didn't go go see this movie. But my parents like they were very not about going out to see the movies. Like I was the one that did that. We wanted to rent movies, and I can remember the first time we rented. Austin Powers. Okay. And and, and yeah, yeah, I know that's kind of a that seems like a tame movie now, but for when it came out, the amount of times that Austin Powers speaks about shagging, can we, as I, I should say, oh, yeah. and, and, and all shagging, yeah, all the shagging <laughs> and all the shagging toys and implements and all those <laughs> things like that. That sort of was. I was probably a little too uh, young to watch that with my parents at the time, and that created some awkward things. And I can remember. Um, my mom, about half an hour into the movie, just walked out. Like she just <laughs> left the room. She was like, I'm not wasting my time with this. She, I am not wasting my time with this. And I remember I had once asked her to watch the sequel. I remember when the sequel came out, I was like, hey, you want to watch the sequel? She was like, no. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting is my species birthday. My parents actually gave me a Swedish made genital pump. Not really. <laughs> Wait right, a second. Chef, wow. What's going on with you? What was the most awkward <laughs> movie going experience you had with your oh, parent or let's guardian? Let's go back into that way back machine. All right. <laughs> <sighs> 1977. Uh, Bee Gees kicking out some jams. <laughs> Staying alive. We're a little, I'm okay. a little kid. I'm like, I'm a little AM alive. FM radio. I'm like, hey, I love this music. Me and my <laughs> sister are playing, pretend we're DJs, like Ooh. playing the record. And then we go see that movie. It's called Saturday Night Fever. 
It's John Travolta's breakout role. We knew him for as from Welcome Back, Cotter mm -hmm. as uh, Vinny Barbarino. We we're like, hey, Barbarino's in it. <laughs> Guess what's also in it? Tons of sex, and drugs, <laughs> and suicide, and drinking, and madness. We weren't prepared for it, and I was there with my parents. <laughs> It was very weird, you know, watching some uh, sex activity. They were like, in the we back don't like Vinny car. anymore. Yeah, what is going on with Vinny? There's like almost rape happening. There's violence. They're fighting gangs. A kid's like, looking at me, look at me, falls off a bridge. Strange trauma zone. Like at the end, he's riding the train. Like, More than a woman riding that train. He comes back. It was an incredible movie. Maybe not so much for like when you're like nine. So. I remember my parents were very uncomfortable and shifting around, kept looking at me. They're not the kind of parents who would cover your face or anything, but I could tell they were like, oh God, we, oh, we, we screwed did, up. But did they do? did let me and my sister go see the Bee Gees. You know, that was my very first right. I always well wondered what the origin story, because you can tell by the way Schnepp uses his walk. He's a woman's man, no <laughs> time to talk. That's where it started. It all started there, baby. Natasha, how about you? Any real awkward movie going experiences with you, you guys, and Lorenz? Every like PG 13 or like, don't even think about R rated movie with my parents is uncomfortable. Like, I have two very strict Catholic Latino parents. They don't. They cover my eyes still to this day. Oh, they cover my eyes. Like it's very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm like feeling uncomfortable talking about it. But um, one experience that I do remember, cause there's so many with my parents, I can't pick one out. But one experience I remember is when I first went to see Zoolander um, for one of my mm -hmm. friends that was like what she wanted to do for her birthday. And um, her mom came with us and she knew, she's like, Natasha, if I don't cover your eyes, your mom's gonna be so mad at me. <laughs> so we're like all sitting in a room, we're watching Zoolander and her mom's like behind me. And I think it was this scene, there's like some sort of threesome action going on oh, with Ben Stiller <laughs> and whatever. So I'm just like watching it and I'm like, uh, like I know her, her mom's gonna like cover my eyes and just slowly, just the hand uh, <laughs> just uh, in front of me. And I was uh, so embarrassed because all my friends are just looking at me like laughing, like, hey, your mom's not even here. <laughs> She's like covering that's, your eyes. Because now, like in your in your database, there the films exist, but there's a hand that's in, in <laughs> yeah. certain scenes. A giant hand comes. It's like, was that in the movie? I remember a giant hand coming in. It's like just this ominous yeah. hand yeah. just coming in front of me. Yeah, no, it was. I mean, it's uncomfortable. But what do you got to do? Strict hey. parents. Hey, that, that, that's parenting. And if Natasha's parents mm -hmm. are watching, I just want to say I apologize for the Swedish pump joke I just made. It was totally mm -hmm. out of left field. My bad, guys. Hats off to the hands yep. for Natasha's family. <laughs> that's the way you treat, Thanks, raise mom kids. Thanks, and dad. All right. Well, actually, this next mailbag, I don't think it's any cleaner. What yeah. is it? Yeah. Okay. So Adam writes, what is the best use of swear words in a movie? For me, it will always be Kevin Bacon in Tremors when he says at the top of his lungs, F you, to the monster that they just happened to kill with dumb luck. <laughs> that scene always has me cracking up in tears. Yeah. I mean, the F word, it, it's one of my all time favorite words just because if it's, <laughs> if it's used wisely and it's used with caution, you can really <laughs> hit with it, man. It can really accentuate a joke. It can set a mood. If you're just running around F and F and F and F and it right. loses some of its mm -hmm. luster. But if you save up kids, this is a good lesson, okay? If you save up your F and use it at the right time, it can really have an impact. Bob Odenkirk is one of the best. I've never heard somebody swear and be that funny when he's swearing. That's primarily from his Mr. Show days. One F word that always stands out to me in movies is, and it's I think it's the only F word in the entire movie, Spaceballs. Mm -hmm. When oh. Dark Helmet is, he wants to go ludicrous speed and they open up the hatch where you would pull the lever mm -hmm. and it says like it needs to be repaired or something and he yells F even <laughs> in the future nothing works it is so funny it hits so hard in that movie it's the perfect time that is my favorite use of the F word of all time Schnapp, what do you got? Well, in my database, I was scrolling through it. I got a couple that aren't F-bombs, but the F-bomb that is my favorite since I saw it in the theater is the Terminator when the landlord's like, hey, what are you doing in there, bub? What, hey, what's going on? <laughs> and it's like scrolling through, you know, like, how do you, mm -hmm. how should I respond? I'm busy, I'm this. He's like, fuck you, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, ah, all right. This is the, my favorite response ever. Pretty good at delivering an F bomb. I'm not even going to ask mm -hmm. Natasha because I don't want her I, to get grounded. I can't even remember. You don't want to see the yeah. hand coming out. I, right. I want to be put in timeout when She's I get like, home. She's like, my favorite time. <laughs> We're like, where did her yeah. mom come from? Yes, from the Conjuring 4. Mrs. Martinez. Yeah. Just the Latino ghost. Me. She's like, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I see the ghost use these spectral goggles. The mother's there. <laughs> <laughs> what did I tell that. you guys? We can have yeah. a good conversation. Mm -hmm. Then Schnapp elevates it to 
to another level. That's why we love you. Inman, your favorite use of uh, the F-bomb or any other like bad word in movie history. You know, the the one that stands up the most to me, and it, it, it is probably, it's the most recent of the batch that you guys uh, requested, is that uh, it is the only one in the entire movie, and I think it was Matthew Vaughn who used it, and he used it oh, well. Yeah. The X Men First Class, where they go, they walk into Wolverine, yeah. and they say, "Hey, come join our team." And he says, "Fudge off! Yes. I'm gonna, I'm, I'll be kind to uh, right. Sasha's mother." Right. Uh, Sasha. Sasha's mother. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that Sasha. is that, that is the best because you didn't know if you're gonna see Wolverine in mm -hmm. First Class or not, and then they start recruiting mutants all around the world, yeah. and all in our head, yep. we're like, "Well, we know there's one mutant that we don't know if he's in the movie, mm -hmm. but certainly be see to cool." And it's classic Wolverine. And they yeah. do, and they and they and they nod to it again in Days of Future Past, where yeah. Xavier says it back to Wolverine. Yep. They're like, mm -hmm. "Oh, I remember you." Back, I'm gonna say the yeah. exact same thing back to you. But it, that that's it's a well done PG-13. You get one, yeah. and you save it for the right scene, and it works. Yeah. Spend Most your definitely. f bombs wisely, kids. It's gonna help you out in the long run at your next job interview. <laughs> okay, I said we <laughs> save some time for your Twitter <laughs> questions. Uh, we only got room for a couple, so let's go quick. Natasha, what's first up in the Twitter sphere? Okay, Sam Carco asks, thoughts on the confirmed 2019 release date for the Wicked movie? This news just dropped. For the Wicked movie. Yeah, All the right. Uh, I would have ah. to do some research into what exactly the Wicked movie is, but it sounds uh, <laughs> No, it's the scary. musical, the, uh, the Wizard of Oz. Oh, Wicked. Yeah. Wicked, yeah. Wicked, 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 I'm a witch, or whatever the song is. <laughs> it's Glenda the Good Witch. I'm surprised yeah. it's going to be that long, the 2019, because that thing was a huge hit on Broadway, and it right. has been for the better part of the last decade at least. Maybe Maybe they Buy wanted or sell before 2025. <laughs> totally buy. <laughs> before your odd time frame, I will totally buy that right. happening. I buy, I die before that. Super, happens, the the way, super decade plus buy. Yeah. I mean, I, but I, I think that with Wicked, maybe the, one of the reasons why they got stopped in their tracks a little bit is because the Oz, the Great and Powerful, whatever that movie came out, and it maybe didn't have the impact that they wanted it to. So that pushes Wicked sure. back a little bit. But I'm surprised it's gonna. We have to wait until 2019. But I hear nothing but great things about the the musical. So. Uh, yeah, I'd be in. Yeah, it's a, I would see 2018 more than 2019, but it could be that they, they've already secured all, all the release dates because a lot of studios now are like popping down their tent poles like, mm -hmm. we got these dates covered. These are our big 10 movies. So maybe they just can't put it in 2018. Even if they got it into in front of the cameras at the end of this year, we have 2017 shooting, editing, reshoots. So I would see it as 2018. They could always say they're going to put it out in 2019 they get it done have some audience reactions like we've got a giant hit then plop it up like christmas 2018 <laughs> against star wars or whatever well so. obviously we know if this movie has to have any reshoots then the entire project is screwed <laughs> okay jason what do you think before 2019 or during that year we're we gonna see wicked i i think we'll see it i think we'll i think we'll definitely see it like the time for the movie musicals are right uh, I, I think we were talking about Barnum and Bailey earlier. I, I yeah. think they're they're maybe trying to schedule it because you were talking about musicals are a weird bet. Mm -hmm. You have to find the right moment, and there might be some other musicals coming earlier that we don't know about yet. Hamilton, yeah, yeah. like Hamilton or, or something else. And so maybe they're like, okay, we got to find the right year because yeah, it is a weird thing. Like, I feel that certain movie years have a limited amount of musicals that you can throw in there now. Like, you can maybe get away with maybe six, maybe six, you know, before they'll be on top of each other. So, right. I think we'll definitely see it, though. It's just too popular of a property with mm -hmm. too much built in fan base. By the way, there's like an 8% chance I'm actually related to Alexander Hamilton. I'll know the answer to that before 2025. Damn. Wow. All right. One <laughs> wow. more Twitter question, Natasha. What do we got? Okay. Alexander Burton asks Are certain actors more box office gold than others? Pratt brings gold every time, but Hemsworth without the hand. Hammer always flops. Yeah, and, and you know, a point that uh, our own Christian George Harloff brings up on occasion is that movie stars just do not w open movies the same way that they right. used mm -hmm. to, but there are a few gold bars that you can still rely on to at least make some waves, even if they don't have the impact they used to. Forever Will Smith was the guy you could bank on. You could put Will Smith sitting on the toilet for two hours, <laughs> open it 4th of mm -hmm. July, and it'd make $100 million. That's not the case anymore, but a guy like a Tom Cruise still. I mean, you, you would have mm -hmm. to put him in an action movie, right. but but Jack Reacher probably would not have gotten a sequel, or maybe even gotten made in the first place, if yeah. you didn't have that star power being in the film. And I think Jack Reacher, too, looks good, actually. A large reason is because Tom Cruise is playing Jack Reacher. Jason? Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, it is interesting, because I've been saying that for years, actually, about Chris Helmsworth. I mean, and, and like I, every movie that, except for, I would say, Star Trek, Mm -hmm. Which I think came out before he was. Yeah, he like gets his no, first, he gets his first, no credit yeah, yeah. for opening yeah, yeah, Star Trek. Yeah, yeah. You no. know, I mean, he's like he's the heart of the opening of Star Trek. But that's pre Hammer. Mm -hmm. Right. A post Hammer uh, uh, Thor, he hasn't been able to pull it off. Like no. he needs the help. And I agree with you that yeah, stars can't 
don't really open movies anymore. Tom Cruise is a very good example of that uh, um, because he has like, I guess the m most amazing script reader in the world, mm -hmm. or he knows a good script when he reads it because his movies are generally solid. And, and Chris Pratt is a very good choice too because like he's generally been funny, although we really haven't seen him do anything outside of Star-Lord, Parks and Rec. He's kind of stayed in that ballpark. It'll be interesting to see once he starts branching out and trying to go for his Oscar, I assume, right. and uh, see what he does when he goes dramatic. Yeah, I mean, Schnepp, you look at a lot of the movies, the big movies that we talk about, and it's more of a built-in property mm -hmm. than it is a star. But, I mean, even the movie poster behind Jason, you got The Rock and you have Kevin Hart. Those are two guys that you can put them on a movie poster, and they're going to be a huge credit to the movie and maybe mean tens of more millions of dollars at the box office. I think with something like that, I'm glad you brought that up. You, you put two no names and you use the word central intelligence, no one's going to see it. So stars do have some power at the box office. Like if I just saw that, I'd be like, oh, okay, that looks like that's probably a comedy. If nobody even told me anything mm -hmm. about it, you see The Rock, Kevin Hart, you're just like, all right, I, I bet it's gonna be fun. I would go see it and I still want to see it because of the trailer. It looks like it looks like a fun film. I think stars nowadays can't just straight up open a film. Like if you put Chris Pratt in a strange drama, like mm -hmm. set in like, you know, 19, uh, ni the 19, early 1900s in America, like a weird factory, like my, I gotta save my daughter or something, but it was- Depression weird. era Yeah, Pratt. Depression era Pratt. daughter in a factory? Um, <laughs> yeah, because the guy who is the, no cat shoes. the caterpillar man, <laughs> yeah. the guy who has no arms or legs no. is running this factory. Oh, no. Okay. And so anyway, I'm just saying, Stars have to be in the right the, the right thing. I think Independence Day is a good example of like, hey, it's something that we saw 20 years ago. They got all the character mm -hmm. actors who were in that and as many of the stars who could, they could get to come back to be in it. But ultimately, like if they just put out Independence Day Resurgence and it was a brand new cast, it might not have the same impact than when you could see, no. man, that's Judd Hirsch. And he's, ah, they like to destroy the monuments. Jeff Goldblum. You have to get <laughs> I love those that you people went with back. Judd Hirsch is number one. <laughs> right. Well, Judd like, Hirsch. They're all going to see him. No, Judd Hirsch. Like, Hirsch. Man, <laughs> Judd Hirsch playing, <laughs> playing that chess. Come on, man. I can't wait to see that happen. And then a, a rippling <laughs> blow up. The aliens, they got me. <laughs> Everybody dies. You know, we're, that's what we're paying that money for. Hey, you know what? Speaking of Independence Day Resurgence, that does have a Hemsworth in it. And he's probably oh, not the reason right. why right. you're seeing Liam this Liam Hemsworth is not the reason you're seeing that film. We're so. for you, Liam. We hope you survive the alien attack that's coming out next weekend in theaters. Mm. That does it for today's action-packed episode of Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank everybody, both behind the scenes and up front, here at the desk with me. First up, Mr. John Schnepp. Where can everybody find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. I'm going to go check out E3, see some games. You saying Batman VR. I'm going to check out a bunch of awesome games. Mafia 3. I got a couple hours. I'm going to run in there. Uh, and see you later. I'm going to work on my horror musical. Have <laughs> <laughs> I would pay a lot of money. I am seriously that. working on it. Maybe Aunt May makes a cameo. I'm just asking hey, questions here. Mr. Possibly. Jason Inman, again, we mentioned at the top of the show, you got a big battle tomorrow with Gray Drake from Rotten Tomatoes. We just talked for an hour about movies. Do you feel a little smarter than you did? Um, there are some parts where I feel uh, dumber. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but there are a couple facts. I mean, if there's an Indiana Jones round, I'm going to kill it. Hey, they're going to kill us. Yeah, I've got a special know. booster card pack with the Magic the Gathering <laughs> lightning sword that Mark Ellis signed. Is it the Caterpillar Man booster card pack? the Caterpillar hey. Man lightning blast. <laughs> All I'm saying is the wheel makes some funny spins sometimes. Yeah, can, in the movie right. I'm powering up right yeah. now, 2025. I'm bringing, I'm, like I said, I'm bringing a special weapon with me, so hopefully it, 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 it's not a blunt force weapon, but I'm hoping it gives me the power to, to beat Gray Drake, but I'm a little afraid. All right. We'll have to see what happens yeah, yeah. tomorrow. That's going to be up tomorrow <laughs> afternoon right here at Collider Video. And, of course, Natasha Martinez, where can everybody find find you probably with a hand over your eyes. <laughs> yes, you can <laughs> find Don't swear. Me. <laughs> Don't say anything bad. You guys you. can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. Make sure you guys follow her and all of us up here at the table. You guys can find me at Mark Ellis Live on all the social media platforms. This weekend, Friday and Saturday, I'll be at the Ice House Comedy Club in Pasadena, California. You guys can get tickets at my website, markellislive.com. That does it for us. Thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.